So when we had met last time, we talked about something called synchronized collections, and I talked a bit about what those were. If you recall, those were wrappers around the Java collections, like HashMap or ArrayList and Set and so on. What we're going to do now is we're going to talk about something called concurrent collections. And these, as we'll see, do better than the synchronized connections collections. Um, there's a bunch of them. You can see con concurrent map, concurrent hash map, synchronous queue, array blocking queue, linked blocking queue, various other kinds of things, con concurrent linked queue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll talk about how these mechanisms overcome some of the limitations we talked about last time with respect to the synchronized collections, which all had a single lock. These are more clever. So the concurrent collections are similar in many ways to the synchronized collections. There's actually a couple of changes that are very important, especially the no notion of being able to block for some of the, uh, the queues when the queue is empty or full, which is something that you don't really get with the synchronized collections, but you do get with concurrent collections. But there's also some other features that, that they add above and beyond what you get with synchronized collections as well. Most importantly, is that concurrent collections are thread safe, but generally not governed by just a single mutual exclusion lock. So if you recall the way things work for the synchronized collections, we had this, this uh, wrapper that would use the decorator pattern to encapsulate a non-synchronized collection with a synchronized collection, and there was always one lock in there. If you recall, it was like a, a mutex object, and then the various methods that were the decorator methods would first synchronize on that lock and then forward to the actual collection and then release the lock. So the problem there was there was a uh, typically a single point of contention which made things not scale up very well if you had lots of threads or maybe lots of cores. The other thing that, that the uh, synchronized collections didn't really do was come up with really clever techniques for being able to handle memory consistency issues. And uh, the, the way they handled everything was just by using a, syn a synchronized st uh, statement with a synchronized lock, which is very, it works, but it's sort of heavyweight. So instead, what we do with the uh, concurrent collections is we have some way of being able to have threads that will work properly. And um, what a, this defines what's known as a happens before relationship. So a happens before relationship is a guarantee that memory written by one specific statement is made visible to other specific statements, typically in other threads, that occur after a lock is released. So as you can see in this little piece of code, we have thread A, which is doing a bunch of stuff, affecting a bunch of shared mutable state, uh, such as setting the value of a field Y to something, acquiring a lock, then setting a value of field X to something, and then releasing the lock, and so what will happen here is when thread B runs, anything that occurred before the unlock on M will be visible to thread B. So you can see when we go into thread B and we read X, that will be the X that has been updated by, by thread A. If we didn't have the, the lock going on here, we wouldn't get this property because it wouldn't have been pushed to the other threads through the cache. And so we wouldn't have been able to ensure that happens before relationship. An example of this would be where a thread adds an object to a collection. So we might have a producer that's going to put a string or some other type into an array blocking queue. And we want to make sure that when a consumer comes along to remove that item from the array blocking queue, that it's actually visible. Because that would be a real problem if it got stuck in there, but another thread couldn't take it out. So these happens before relationships are things that are defined by the underlying um, concurrent collections. And then we'll also see that the other thing that some of the concurrent collections do is they let you wait for the collection to um, have its, its preconditions or guards fulfilled. So you can wait while the con connect the uh, array blocking queue has nothing in it. You can wait. When the array blocking queue is full, you can wait. Not every one of the co concurrent collections provides this waiting behavior, but the ones that are the blocking queues do. And that's how you do these kind of producer-consumer-like interactions, much like we're seeing here. 
We're going to focus on the concurrent hash map. That's one of the most interesting of the various concurrent collections. As you can see, there's a, a, a lot of methods that are defined on concurrent hash map. It implements basically the, the collection interface plus some concurrency related stuff. And it's got some really, really interesting semantics. So basically what it does is it has a hash table under the hood and each hash table has a uh, balanced binary tree of items that hash to that location in the hash table. So I'm sure you, you all remember how hash tables work with uh, taking whatever the key is and applying some mathematical function to it, coming up with a value, and then distributing it somewhere in the, the array that's used as the hash table. And unlike conventional hash tables where they simply have a, a linked list of things that resolve to the same location, the concurrent hash map has a balanced tree that's used there. So it makes it um, basically operations are, are guaranteed to be, be log n in the worst case. Whereas with a conventional hash table, if you get unlucky, then you can have linear time if things all hash to the same place, for example. And I like to, you know, when thinking about metaphors for this, I think about going to an outdoor concert or an event or a race or something, and you've got a whole bunch of different uh, porta potties, and then there are lines for each porta potty, right? So think of a balanced tree of, uh, you know, data structures that all go to the same location. The concurrent hash map is optimized for multi core CPUs. What the heck does that mean? Well, what that means is under the hood, they actually have what are called segment locks. So instead of having a single lock, which is what the synchronized map does, where there's just one lock for the entire table, what we have with concurrent hash map are segment locks. So let's say for sake of argument that we've got, I don't know, a, a, a table of a thousand elements in it. Uh, obviously you could put more elements in the hash map because they would hash and flesh out the balanced trees that come off of those elements in the array. But what they do is they break up the hash table array into 16 different segments. And there's a different lock for each of the segments. And so one of the consequences of that is as long as you end up hashing to things that are in different segments, you won't be competing for the same lock at all. So there's just no contention. And that's kind of why I think about the uh, different lines at the porta potty stations at a concert or an outdoor event, because you're only competing for the people standing in line at that porta potty, not all the porta potties. So in contrast, the synchronized map only uses a single lock. So as a consequence, it's going to be much less scalable, because if you, no matter what you do, you're all going to be having the threads contend for that single lock. Whereas with the concurrent hash map, you're going to be splitting up the synchronization. There's some other cool things that concurrent hash map provides, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about this as we get further into the course. And I'll show you some really cool examples, starting with the next example we'll look at after this overview, called atomic check then act methods. And there's a bunch of them. There's put if absent, there's compute if absent. We'll be focusing primarily on compute if absent. And what compute if absent does is it goes and checks to see whether a given key has a value already. If there is a value already, it returns the value associated with that key. If there is no value for that key, however, yet, it, the compute if absent method calls a, uh, a function that's passed in to compute the value. And it does it in a very clever way so that it only computes for the first thread that comes along that's trying to add something with that key uh, or add that key. And so what's interesting about this is even if you have multiple threads simultaneously calling compute if absent on the same key, that function only runs one time. And then the other threads will then get the results. Even if they all come in at the same time, the function gets run once, and then after the value is computed, then all threads that we're trying to add or trying to do something with that key will all get the updated value. And we'll talk more about that in a minute, and I'll show you some examples. So it's, it's very cool. And this is called atomic check then act. This, of course, is in contrast to something else we'll see in a second called uh, non-atomic check then act, which is 
fine for single-threaded programs, but a real problem for multi-threaded programs. So basically, this is kind of what compute if absent does. If the key isn't already associated with a value, then attempt to compute the value using the given mapping function and then enter it into the map. So in essence, what happens here is um, compute if absent is essentially what's shown at the bottom. So you, you come along and you say, you know, compute if absent, give it a key. If the key is there, you get back, if the key's already in the map with a value, you get the value back. Otherwise, you go ahead and do some computation that will make a new value with some function of that key. And that's in contrast to the code I show up above. This is the way the code works logically, but under the hood, of course, it does it in a very clever and optimized atomic way. So what Computer Absent does is it checks to see if there's already a key, and uh, if there is no key, it goes ahead and applies the mapping function, and then it adds the new value into that key. Otherwise, if you already found a key, it just returns the key. So in both cases, you get the, the sorry, it returns the value. In both cases, you get the value back, but in the case where it wasn't already there, it would go ahead and call a function and then add the value to that. So the main difference between the code on the top and the code on the bottom is that the code on top is not atomic, whereas the code on the bottom is. And it's also optimized in a very clever way. OK, so that's basically um, the way this works. There's also something called put if absent, which adds a value if it's not already there. So we have compute if absent, which calls a function to make a value on a key if it's not already there. We have put if absent, which adds a value if it's not already there, but it doesn't call a function. You have to have the value already. There's also some other really cool methods. There's replace. And what replace does, there's a couple of different versions of replace. What replace says is, if we have a key in the map, then replace that key with this value. So you can see that replace will atomically check if the map contains the key, and then it gives it a new value. Uh, obviously, um, so, so that's, what, that's what replace is doing. There's also another interesting method, which is called replace, and it's the three-value version of replace. And this is essentially kind of a compare and swap operation. And it turns out to be enormously helpful for certain programs. And I'll show you some examples later. So what this does is it says if the key is in the map and the key has a current value, which is the expected value, replace the expected value with the new value or replace the old value with the new value, and do that whole thing atomically. So this is basically like a hash table version of the compare and swap operation. So it replaces an entry for a key only if that key has a given value. And this is really super, super cool. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of how to do it, do more things with it later. Um, again, I'm showing you this code that's kind of like the code under the hood. But keep in mind that that code um, is not actually how it's implemented because it's done much more cleverly and much more atomically. And the way it does it under the hood is by using the compare and swap optimized methods that are part of uh, the Java unsafe uh, class, which is very clever but also very tricky to use properly, which is why they don't, they don't expose it to the application programmers. The other sets of things you can do with concurrent collections relate to the uh, whole concept of blocking queues. So remember, we have array blocking queue, and we have um, linked blocking queue. There's a whole pile of blocking queues. There's uh, synchronous queue, priority blocking queue, and, and so on and so forth. And um, these, these different queues all have the property that when the queue is empty, you have to wait. And when the queue is full, you have to wait. So at the boundaries of the conditions, then you have to wait. And uh, the way that works under the hood, of course, is there's some kind of bounded buffer, either bounded by the sense of being you know, n elements in an array or being a linked list that's not allowed to get beyond a certain size. And so or it doesn't let you grow it beyond a certain size. And so therefore, under the hood, when you reach the edge cases, either it's empty or it's full, 
the threads will, will go to sleep. And um, not surprisingly, under the hood, the blocking cues are typically implemented using the condition objects we talked about before, because they have to find a way to wait in a guarded suspension-like model until the state becomes what they're expecting. OK, so that's basically a quick overview of Java concurrent collections. I'll show you some really cool examples of how to use the concurrent hash map in a second, but this is just kind of an overview. And you'll need to know how to use concurrent collections, in particular, the concurrent hash map for assignment number three.